if you're new to assembly, you've probably seen a lot of register names. For example, R-A-X, E-A-X, A-X, A-H, A-L. And it's a little bit daunting sometimes if you're not used to it to know what register is for what and how many there are. But the funny thing is all the registers I just listed out are actually part of the same physical register. So let's go through the different registers in the x86-64 architecture because it's fewer than you think. So if we backtrack to the 1970s, Intel is a pretty new company. They only have two chips. Their first chip was the 1103, which was the first sort of commercially viable RAM chip. Their RAM amount was actually one kilobit. So obviously today we have gigabytes and gigabytes, but that was the first time that we were able to get RAM in its sort of modern form, and it helped to phase out the magnetic cores that were being used at the time for memory. And then their second chip, the 4004, was released in 1971. That was a CPU for a calculator. So it wasn't really general purpose like how we know them to be today. Their third chip, though, is the one that really matters. And the funny part is that it wasn't even their idea. In 1969, there was a company called Datapoint that was trying to make a personal computer. They had a CPU that they built themselves, but it was made up of like dozens or hundreds of transistors. And it was a very prototypey CPU. And Intel had just been founded in 1968 by Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore, who were seniors at Fairchild Semiconductor. So they were sort of like the masters of silicone. I think Robert Noyce is one of the, the co-inventors of the integrated circuit. And even though Intel hadn't finished any products by that time, the reputation of Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore spoke for itself. So data point hired Intel to turn their prototype into a microchip. So they were hired in 1969, and by 1970, Datapoint wanted to push ahead with their product, but Intel was nowhere near being ready. So Datapoint went with their prototype design and began manufacturing and selling their Datapoint 2200 in 1970, pretty much just a computer built from TTL logic chips. However, while Intel was developing the chip, even though they were late and I guess they sort of like lost a the job, they sort of fell in love with that chip that they were making. They loved the simplicity and how clean the instruction set architecture or the ISA was that Datapoint had. And they opted to continue working on the chip for their own benefit and license it from Datapoint. And that chip ended up being the 8008, released in 1972. So their original ISA and their register layout came from Datapoint's idea. It shipped with four general purpose registers, A, B, C, and D. They were eight bits since the entire CPU was an eight bit CPU. And this is what was used. And these were the general purpose registers. Now, originally A really stood for accumulator because it was used for a lot of arithmetic and there were certain rules that you had to use it for. B was also called a base and it's what you would use if you wanted to access memory uh, and use it as an offset. So pretty much a pointer. It was gonna hold a memory position and you could only do certain operations with the specific register. So you had to be very careful about what you were using. Uh, C stood for counter and it was used in loops and shift operations and stuff like that. And then D was sort of like the data register. Any overflow sometimes would be used with A or for extended uh, values. Also results from multiply and divide were put into the D register. So Intel shipped with these registers here. And there also was a stack pointer, but I'm gonna be focusing more on the general purpose ones. So I had A, B, C, and D and the stack pointer. And this was the 8008, released in 1972. And in 1978, they released the 8086, which of course, basically legendary CPU at this point, really transformed personal computers. And this chip went to a 16-bit system. So they still had these A, B, C, and D 8-bit registers, but they needed to make them larger. So the solution that they found was they would actually expand A and rename those lower eight bits into AL and expand it into having an upper or higher byte. So instead of it being eight bit, it's now 16 bits and you can control the entire register with the AX register. So what started as A became AL. They added eight bits on top of it, called that AH and called the entire thing AX. And the same thing for BX, CX, DX was done. They tried to keep backwards compatibility by allowing you to talk to those original registers by just using the AL, BL, CL, and DL now, uh, but you had the full 16-bit power available with just AX, BX, CX, and DX, and that was the 8086. Another thing that the 8086 did was added the SI, DI, and base point registers. The stack pointer was already there from before, but again, I'm not really gonna talk about these two so much. So SI and DI were used for a lot of like string operations. This really stood for source index and destination index. So if you wanted to copy a string or something like that, you might say that this is where, this is a pointer to where the string starts, and this is the uh, location of where you wanna put the string. So source and destination, uh, and these also were 16 bit. So this is how the 8086 transformed things. We took the A, B, C, and D from before 8-bit, turned them into 16-bit, and you could split them up. You can use now two separate 8-bit 
registers, AL, AH, BL, BH, CL, CH, and so on, or you can talk to the entire 16-bit register, but it's all part of the same register. You're just able to access different parts of it. Then in 1985, the 8386 was released. And again, the system went up now to 32-bit. So we had these old registers, AX, BX, CX, DX, SI, DI, uh, the base pointer and the stack pointer, and these were 16-bit versions. But they wanted to increase it now to a 32-bit version. So again, instead of erasing anything they had before, they kept AX for us to talk to that original 16-bit that the 8086 uh, had, but they're just gonna expand it now and call it EAX for extended, so that we could talk to now the entire 32-bit value with one register. So again, EAX is the entire register. If you wanna talk to the lower 16 bit, you could use AX. If you wanna talk to the lowest byte, you can use AL. And if you wanted to talk to that second byte, I guess you could say from the least significant bit, you can use AH. So it just gave you a very dynamic way of accessing the same 32 bits of data to match your needs. And the same thing happened with B, C, D. So we had now at this point, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. So it's still four main general purpose registers, but we can access smaller subsets of them to keep backwards compatibility and for finer grain control. Source index, destination index, base pointer, stack pointer followed suit. Now this is ESI, EDI, EBP, and ESP. And then of course in 2003, AMD released the first 64-bit processor, Intel followed suit. And again, it was extended. Uh, EAX 32 bits, now doubling that space, calling it RAX. R just means register. So we have 64 bits in RAX, we can access the bottom 32 with the AX. We can access the bottom 16 with AX, access the bottom byte with AL and the byte above that with AH. And it's the same thing here, RAX, RBX, RCX, RDX, and the source index, RSI, destination index, RDI. And now as we moved forward in time, the responsibilities and limitations of each register kind of got diluted, but there are still some that exist. For example, if you're gonna use a division operation on x86-64, you need to make sure that RDX is clear. Where's RDX? RDX is here. You have to make sure it's clear because when you divide, uh, the number you want to divide into needs to be an RAX. And then when you divide by whatever operand you choose, whether RBX, RCX, or whatever, the remainder is going to go into RDX. And RAX is going to get the quotient. So if you divide like 10 divided by 3, 10 needs to be an RAX. You divide it by 3. This becomes 3 because 3 times 3 is 9. And there's one remainder, and that goes into RDX as long as it was cleared. Uh, beforehand. So there are one or two little rules that we have to continue using, but uh, generally speaking, it's kind of free now. You can sort of do whatever you want. The calling convention for Linux in x64 has RAX uh, taking the return value. So when you call a function, you usually want to put RAX as a return value. And there's also the calling convention uh, when you're going to pass arguments to a function, you have to use it in a certain order, at least with the convention, RDI, RSI, and, and so on. Another thing that the 64-bit processors introduced was more registers. So now instead of having just these registers here, they added R8 through R15, which are just more general purpose 64-bit registers. But we can see how the original ones got their start. So again, it looks really confusing sometimes when you see all these different registers, but when you break it down into their origins, it becomes a bit more manageable to use them all for their different purposes. So if you need to use individual bytes, like for example, characters, then you'd use the AL, BL, CL, DLs. If you wanted to use 16 bits, you might use AX, BX, CX, or DX and 32-bit EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, and 64-bit versions are RAX, RBX, RCX, RDX. But again, same physical register, same exact uh, space. You're just able to talk to different sections at a time or the entire thing with RAX as we currently stand. And one more little quirk here, one of the conveniences that they built into the 64-bit system is if you have a value in RAX and you set a value to EAX, it's gonna automatically zero out the upper 32 bits of RAX. But if you write to any other of the subsets, it won't do that zeroing out. So EAX and EBX, ECX, EDX are the only ones that when we write to their 32-bit version, in this case, EAX or EBX, it will automatically zero out any other bits to make sure that then the value you put into EBX is gonna be the same value that's in RBX. But if you have a value in RBX or EBX and you write into these uh, lower registers, it's not gonna zero out or zero extend the values. So a little quirk, and we can look at this in the emulator real quick as we step through, let's just set a value to RAX, some random value here, and we can see that when we set EAX, let's say to the value of two, we can see that RAX has been wiped out except for that two. Now let's reset RAX to a long value and let's change the first byte to let's say a one. And we can see 
that RAX continues to hold the entire value and only that first byte was changed. So there's one or two little quirks, but overall it's pretty straightforward. So I hope this helps. I know that uh, sometimes the different registers can be a bit confusing, but just know that it's it's simpler than it looks. Uh, and I think knowing the history of, of how we got here helps to understand that they're all just pieces of the same register that started way back in the late 1960s uh, that we're still developing and, and improving on today. So I hope this helps. What I'll probably do is a short, uh, like a, a tiny tutorial in assembly just to write some basic functions and then move on from assembly. I think I've been on assembly for a while now, so it might be time to move on, but we'll write some functions first. And now that we know some of these registers a little bit better, hopefully that should benefit us. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon.